This podcast is brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. Thanks for listening. Here's our show. What in the hell's going on? What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You don't have to know what the hell is on it. What the hell's the matter with these guys? We don't know what's going on. What the hell's going on? Who in God's name knows what it's all about? <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, I think you know what the hell is going on. Yeah, what the hell is going on is the Supreme Court has laid out a bunch of decisions for the American people. We're uh, thrilled by them. Some are not. We're going to talk today about three major decisions. One, overturning Biden's Student Loan Act. Second, allowing a a religious exemption from LGBTQ-affiliated business requests. And third, uh, rejecting affirmative action in college admissions. We have a wonderful guest, Jonathan Turley, who's a colleague of mine on Fox News, uh, who's one of the best legal analysts uh, in the country, and we're going to get into the legal aspects of this with him. But let's talk a little bit about the politics of this, because there's politics obviously involved in all these things. What do you think of these decisions, Danny? So, first of all, I think you actually characterized 303 Creative LLC versus LN. I said a little wrong. This was really a First Amendment case. This wasn't about LGBTQ plus, I can't keep track, but it wasn't about that at all. Uh, It was simply about people's right to speak and to control their work in the way that they choose. And it was uh, a real vote of confidence for free speech. In terms of the politics, I think Every day, in every way, our country's leadership has further lost its mind. Our Constitution is no longer the crowning document of our nation. It's no longer the pillar of our rule of law. We are now ruled by country club members and Ivy League school graduates and uh, and people from California. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's New York, Washington, L.A., and San Francisco. They're ruling the airwaves. They're ruling the country. They're ruling the Democratic Party. It's insane. So what's happened to the left and free speech? The left used to be the, the champion of free speech. There was the whole in the 60s was the free speech movement. And now they don't seem to care. This is, I mean, whatever you think about this web designer's uh, opinions on same-sex marriage, whether you support same-sex marriage or oppose same-sex marriage, the reality is in our country, we don't have compelled speech. You can't force somebody to articulate views that they don't agree with. By the way, but, just just to put it in another way, this is how over the last weekend a whole bunch of Nazis were were demonstrating outside a synagogue. Well, that's because the, the court said that they could because they were engaging in free speech. Be, because, I didn't think they were, but but that I mean the the point of the first amendment is to protect unpopular speech, which supporting same-sex marriage used to be not that long ago. We, it, we, the, that is why we have a First Amendment, so that unpopular speech can be protected. And what I just don't get about this is, like, this is a fundamental difference between the right and the left. If someone is a conservative and doesn't believe in gay marriage, they don't do gay marriage, right? They don't participate in a gay marriage. If you're on the left, it's like, not only will we participate in gay marriage, but you have to endorse it, too. Yeah. If, we, if, I don't, if I'm a conservative and I don't like guns, I don't buy a gun. If I'm on the left, I say, I'm not going to buy a gun and nobody can buy a gun. Yeah. It's, it's authoritarian impulse. And what it looks like first was Masterpiece Cake Shop, which was a Colorado baker who wouldn't make a cake for a, for a same-sex marriage. And they went after him. And now it's a web designer who wouldn't design. It's like they're going out and trying to find people who disagree with them and force them to say things so that they can get the legal justification to do it. I just don't understand this. This is a Leninist authoritarian impulse. Well, we talked about this. You know, we've talked about this in so many occasions when we had Elliot Shapiro on, if you remember, Mm -hmm. and folks remember that really good podcast we did with him. He said this reminds him most of all of the Cultural Revolution, right? These are struggle sessions. This is this is the absolutism of all of this. The problem is that it, it has infused everything. It has infused speech on TV. It has infused speech in universities. It has infused our daily conversations, right? Uh, It has infused absolutely everything we do. And the worst of it is that everybody takes them to court, right? It's constant, this use of the court to oppress people. and, And the fact that it reached the Supreme Court is a testament to how prevalent this is. It should have never gotten there. Right. This should have, this should have been easily decided uh, by the lower courts. But and the state fact, of Colorado, the state of Colorado contorted itself in order to 
squelch this poor web designer. It was an example of insanity. And again, I say this to our guest, but I want to say it again. If you turn these things around Mm -hmm. and you say, no, they went to somebody who was designing a website who was Jewish, who was asked to design a white supremacist platform, and they said no. Can you imagine yourself a court case over this? Of course you can't. I mean, you don't. You, but this is the thing: you don't see the Christian group opposing same-sex marriage going out and trying to find a LGBTQ web designer and force them to make their website for them. That doesn't oh, well, happen maybe in the same way. Maybe that's coming. <laughs> but if it is, that's regrettable. All there right, were well, a couple spe- of other cases. Well, speaking of contortions, uh, let's talk about the student loan decision. So Joe Biden, you know, goes out and takes this law called the. The Heroes Act, which was a law that was designed in order to make sure that that men and women who stepped forward to serve our country after the 9-11 attacks and were called up to active duty didn't default on their loans. And he took this law and twisted it in order to be able to forgive the loans of hundreds of thousands of people who never served in the military, who never put on the uniform, putting aside the fact that that's like almost an act of stolen valor to do that, to give benefits that were designed for someone who actually sacrificed and put their lives at risk to defend the country. It's completely unconstitutional. You can't spend half a trillion dollars without Congress. Without Congress. I mean, Article One of the Constitution, power of the purse. They write the checks. It, it's it's the most fundamental thing about our, our, our tripartite system of government. And, and, yet, and again, the fact that it got here. The president knew this wasn't legal. His own Department of Justice knew it wasn't legal. The Democratic Speaker of the House is on the record saying it's not legal. But my favorite about this is some, something... I can't remember whether you said it or I said it, which is probably a testament to how much we, time we spend talking to each other. But <laughs> you sa- one of us said, this is literally like the janitor in the doctor's office being asked to pay off the doctor's loans for medical school, right? It is taking expenses from the richest among us and transferring it to the poorest among us. It is, and and that's the thing of it. It is morally wrong. That, That should have been the bright, shining thing out there that people identified. This is morally wrong for our country. This is not stealing from Elon Musk to pay off the janitor in your doctor's office. It's the reverse. It's the reverse. So it allowed couples making up to a quarter of a million dollars to get loan forgiveness. A big uh, segment, I can't remember the exact percentage, but a significant amount of it was graduate school loans because most most loans are graduate school loans that are seeking forgiveness. So you literally have a hospital cafeteria worker who ha- who's being asked to pay off the loans of doctors and nurses in, in their hospital. Uh, it, 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 it's just so fundamentally wrong. And then the other thing, what an assault on responsibility it is, right? If you are a parent who took out a second job so that your kids wouldn't start their lives Uh, in debt because of school. Or you're a student who decided, you know what, I really want to go to Harvard or Yale, but I'm going to go to a state school with in-state tuition because I don't want to start my life out with debt. Or, you know what, I'm going to go to community college because that's more affordable for me. I'm making responsible decisions and not loading myself up with debt that I can't afford to pay. And now those people have to go and bail out the people who made the irresponsible decisions and took out a bunch of loans that they couldn't afford. And that should have been so freaking obvious to our political leaders who somehow are not on the side of the people, but are consistently on the side of the elites against the people. We talked about the assault on the power of the purse. When did Joe Biden announce this plan? He announced it before the the midterm elections, right? He announced it when he controlled had total control of Congress, unified government. They controlled the House. They controlled the Senate. They controlled the White House. He could have passed this using a budget reconciliation bill with Democrat votes only. Why didn't he do it? Because there weren't enough Democratic votes to pass this. He didn't even have enough support in his own party to pass this. So he does it by executive fiat and then blames the conservatives on the Supreme Court for quashing his extra constitutional power grab. I'm sorry. These people have forgotten what democracy means. Didn't didn't have the votes to do it. So, you know, this is an end run around the Democrat-controlled Congress, not against the 
you know, Republicans who uh, who won't who just don't care about right. students. But Chuck Schumer won't say that because he is so fundamentally a political creature, not a creature of his of his chamber in the Congress. Let's talk for a second about the most explosive of the decisions, the one that apparently is putting us back to you know 1861, uh, and that is the decision to uh, to disallow the use of race in university uh, admissions. The explosion around this was nothing short of insane. Insane. Yes. Uh, it, you, you detailed what it is that the American people think about this in our interview with, with, with Jonathan Turley. But suffice it to say, in summary, there is a majority, not Super. just of American white people, but of Americans of every single race. Not just a majority, as you say rightly, Mark, a super majority of blacks, whites, Latinos, Asian people. Everybody thinks the use of race in admissions is wrong. And the Supreme Court agrees with them, and suddenly it's a disaster for our nation. Well, here's the thing also, is that what they, they don't disagree with the goal. They disagree with the tactic, right? It's the the racial preferences they disagree with. Everybody thinks that we should have that the diversity the, the is system, a good thing. That diversity is a good thing, and that we are failing black and Hispanic students, particularly poor ones. Because you know the funny thing is, in a lot of these schools, it, the black and Hispanic kids who are getting in under these racial preferences are actually people with college educated parents who are, right, who are the fairly well of the, off. Of minority elites, and particularly one of the reasons for that is it was a really interesting op-ed in the New York Times about this from somebody who supports affirmative action, who was pointing out that a lot of these schools do not admit kids from poor uh, circumstances, but they do a preference, have a preference for minority elites because it affects their college rankings, because those the poorer kids are more likely to drop out, and that lowers their U.S. news ranking. So they, do, they don't want that to happen. So they're, they're using the racial preferences to benefit minority elites. But here's the thing. We should be concerned, particularly as conservatives, about we should be doubling down on saying this is an opportunity for us to really go out and help these kids because the racial disparities in in secondary and elementary education are a disgrace. And the reason we have those disparities in the way we do is because of a couple of things. But one of them is the fact that kids who are trapped in failing public schools, particularly in, in, in impoverished neighborhoods who are in minority majority neighborhoods, are trapped in those schools while affluent white parents re- have the resources to take their kids out of those schools and put them into private and parochial schools. The answer to this problem is school choice. The answer to this problem, if you care, if you say there's systemic racism or systemic discrimination in our system, I can't think of a bigger form of systemic discrimination than the idea that black and brown parents don't have the choice to take their kids out of, out of failing schools, but white affluent parents do. Our system is set up to make sure that black and brown kids are stuck in the worst schools and affluent white kids can get a better education. We need to correct that. Then the way to correct this situation is that you don't have enough of these kids getting into college and thriving into college is to give them the skills so that they can get into college on merit and thrive there and graduate. And that is not happening in our in, in our country right now, and it's a disgrace. Yeah, it is a disgrace, and nobody's but nobody's embarrassed about that because, of course, in addition to being enthralled to elites, the Democratic Party is enthralled to teachers unions who have Bingo. single-handedly led to the disgrace of minority performance in the schools that they, they are don't want so to confront to. their own culpability they don't want, in this. Exa- exactly, and, and, and also, I, by the way, yeah. the pandemic. OK, yeah. so this is the other thing. And we, we, we harp on this on this podcast, but it's a, but it's important. We just came out. The new nation's report card just came out. We lost because of pandemic lockdowns, two decades of progress in reading and three decades of progress in math wiped away by pandemic lockdowns. And you know who was affected the worst of that? Black and brown kids in p- impoverished neighborhoods. They were out of school longer. Their test scores and their progress in reading and math are worse than white kids. And so the pandemic and the lockdowns that the that the lockdown establishment imposed on these schools did enormous damage to minority kids. And so instead of focusing on let's teach radical ideologies in school, maybe we should be focusing on finding ways to help them catch up. If you don't learn basics of reading and math in younger grades, guess what? You're never going to get into college in the first place. And so we need to make up for the pandemic learning losses. We need to take that on. And we need to give parents of all races the same choices in education.
That's the solution to this problem. That is exactly right. And, and that is the one that is the most racially fair. Right? That is the one that actually benefits people who have been disadvantaged historically. But God forbid we should do this. We need to get to our interview because we've been talking Let's talk so about much. the law. <laughs> <laughs> with, you know, with a lawyer. With an actual lawyer, Jonathan Turley, who Mark said uh, was joining us, is the Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at George Washington University. He's also the director of the Environmental Law Advocacy Center and executive director for the Project for Older Prisoners. He served as counsel on some of the most notable cases in the last two decades, including the representation of whistleblowers, military personnel, judges, members of Congress. He is a Fox News legal analyst, and he is just one of the sort of clearest voices you're going to want to hear in talking about these cases. Here's our interview. Well, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So glad to have you here for the first time. The Supreme Court just dropped a lot of big decisions on the country. I think we say went out with a bang. Went out with a bang. There you go. (laughs) Just give us, first of all, give us your impressions of the term and what the court did. Well, the term actually uh, is far more nuanced than the coverage would indicate, particularly at the close. Most of the cases this term ended as they do in, in other terms. Most of the cases were unanimous or nearly unanimous, or when they divided, they did not break along ideological lines. That's one of the disconnects that you see in the coverage, is that people focus on often a handful of cases that involve these core issues of speech or religion where you do have that natural breaking point uh, along jurisprudential line. The vast majority of cases aren't like that. And that, that's one of the reasons why Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy both objected uh, to characterizations of the court as conservative. You know, Justice Breyer said, that's just not true. You know, the, the, the justices try to get it right, and most of the time, they either all agree or they don't break along that stereotypical line. And that's what we saw. And we also saw uh, the, the court give the Biden administration some huge victories, the most obvious being the ruling in favor of President Biden's immigration policies, allowing him to continue uh, as he has uh, on the southern border. So when this court felt that the law favored the president, they also favored the president. So I agree with everything you just said, but one nuance to that, which is that in these big, high-profile ideological cases where they break down, why is it that the, no one from the liberal bloc ever defects to the conservative side on these kinds of cases, <laughs> right? Like, you know, there, there are no suitors, <laughs> O'Connors, Kennedys, people who are appointed by Democrats who become swing votes and start voting regularly with the right, with the conservative bloc. Why, why is that? That's a fair criticism. I mean, that really, the, 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 it, the only reason I laughed is when I, I testified in the uh, confirmation hearing for Justice Gorsuch, and um, I had some exchanges with the Democratic senators, including Senator Whitehouse. And Senator Whitehouse continually returns to this theme, and, and he did so in that hearing, saying 5-4, five, 5-4, four, five, four. you know, the, these conservative justices are always in the five. They always vote robotically. You know, you can't tell me, Professor, that they are doing an honest job when they always vote together. And I, and I told the senator, aren't you forgetting the four? I mean, because you have four people voting together in that 5-4 series you just read, but they're not viewed as robotic or ideological because you think they're right. And the, the fact is that you want people to be consistent uh, with their jurisprudential views. Now, having said that, Mark, your point is still a very good one. It is far more rare to see uh, a defection from the left these days than from the right. Just as Gorsuch voted fairly often with his liberal colleagues. So that is isn't that is a... <laughs> That is a a glaring inconsistency that comes out of this term. So I have to, I have a confession right up front, which is that our producer gives us research that we put together. 
and the more I read it, the madder I got about this. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so, this makes me so furious for a whole series of, of reasons that aren't interesting and that our readers are probably all aware of from my ranting. But let's start with the easiest case here. Mark and I have talked about the student loan write-off efforts by the president, uh, the president's own admissions he couldn't do it, the Speaker of the House's insistence, former Speaker of the House's insistence that he couldn't do it. But in Biden versus Nebraska, what surprised me in Biden versus Nebraska, which is the decision that uh, that held that the Secretary of Education lacked the authority under the HEROES Act to rewrite the statute and cancel billions in student debt, is that three members of the court actually thought that the president did have this authority. Can you just talk a little bit about this and the decision that was made? Well, the, the really glaring moment came when President Biden not only called this not a normal court, but to call them hypocrites uh, because of their ruling on student loans. This is the man who, who said during the campaign that he didn't have authority uh, to do this, just as Nancy Pelosi did. And, and the reason that was obvious is that they were relying on a five-page law that was clearly intended just to help people who are serving as military personnel in conflicts abroad. It was the sole purpose. It was the only purpose discussed. Uh, it was to help out these individuals. That's why the law was so short. It was, it was, it was a virtual unanimous vote of Congress for that reason. And the Department of Justice looked at this very claim that the president would make and rejected it and said, no, you can't use this, the HEROES Act for this purpose. It would be hijacking the ad. But the president then turned to the usual suspect. It's like Casablanca. Every time something goes wrong, then you've got this Claude Rain moment. And usually the first person through the door is Professor Lawrence Tribe. You know, he was the one that advised the president erroneously that he had the authority to, um, to re-up on the national eviction moratorium, even though the court had already said it was unconstitutional. At least the majority of justices indicated that. Uh, He brought in the same voices and they said, no, go for it. And of course it was uh, an overreach. But what's really astonishing here is not just the justices that ignored all of this, but the fact that so many Democratic members are applauding their own functional obsolescence in our constitutional system. You know, you had uh, Chuck Schumer saying that this was cruel, what the, what the court did. The court just supported his authority. The court just said, <laughs> you can't usurp Congress. And you had Schumer and AOC and others saying, this is outrageous. You know, they're going so far beyond their authority. It's, I'm a Madisonian scholar, and I got to tell you, there are very few things that would surprise Madison, in my view. He was a, he was not just a genius at d- d- designing a constitution, but he really studied humanity to try to come up with a system that would fit it. But I got to tell you, he never saw the likes of Schumer and AOC literally complaining when a court supports their authority. So. Let's just, again, come back to this one question. Folks who don't remember this, this is a very narrowly drafted bill that would have allowed the deferral of student loan debt for members serving in the aftermath of 9-11, so in the fight against terrorists. You're called up after 9-11, active duty. They don't want you to default on your loans because you're serving our country and getting the people Right, so reservists and others. Okay, it's a, it's a short bill. It's a narrowly written bill. What I don't understand, and, and, you know, I worked on the Hill. I wrote these kind of bills. I read these kind of bills. I understand they get lawyered one up one side and down the other. What I don't understand is the three justices who thought that this student loan write-off was consistent with the HEROES Act. Can you explain that? Yeah, like, why wasn't this a unanimous decision? Exactly. (laughs) No, it should have been unanimous. I could understand justices questioning standing. I happen to believe in very broad standing, so I was gladdened by their finding of standing. But there was a legitimate standing question there. It was not an easy one. Uh, So I could see that being a point of contention. But once you got to the merits, I don't see how you could possibly argue that this was not 
a hijacking of this law. Nobody argued an oral argument uh, that uh, Congress ever intended a purpose of this kind. And what's also interesting is that these three justices just ignored the obvious effort to circumvent Congress. I mean, it's very clear because the administration talked openly of finding any way that he could give loan forgiveness without going to Congress. So this was this was a crime in plain view in constitutional terms, and they ignored all of it. Kagan and, 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 and her colleagues just simply said, well, the language is broad enough for me, and we just don't see the, the problem here. Well, there is a problem. I mean, it, it, if, if you undermine the power of the purse, you literally gut Article One of the Constitution. That's the, the main of power. <laughs> right. And they were very cavalier. They just said, oh, well, it's, it's sort of close enough for jazz. <laughs> but is it? I mean, this is the, if you want to talk about hypocrisy, the people on the left, these senators and the president who attacked the legitimacy of the Supreme Court are, in fact, they're the ones who are, you know, they're the ones who are undermining the Constitution. They're waging a, a direct attack on the Article One powers of Congress and the power of the purse. And Congress is upholding the power of the purse. And they're saying you're illegitimate. <laughs> No, it's great. It's like you have all these Democrats that have argued that, as you noted, and they're all saying, how dare you force him to come back to Congress because we don't have the vote, right? We, they're, they're in favor of saving democracy until they really require democracy to get these things done. Everyone knows it's, you could never get this loan forgiveness through Congress. Not today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, because there is a sizable number of people that don't just oppose this, but fervently oppose it. Uh, they believe it's wrong. Well, he announced it when they uh, when he announced this plan when Democrats still had unified control of Congress, and it was a right. and it's a fiscal matter, so it could have been passed through the budget reconciliation process with just Democratic votes, and he didn't have enough Democratic votes to pass this. That's why he did it by executive action. So he bypassed the Democrat-controlled Congress to do this. Yeah, it's it's, it's unbelievable. And there was a time when Joe Biden was faithful to the separation of powers, but that was when he was in the legislative branch. And uh, it's, it's a shame because we used to have people in Congress that really did fulfill the obligation to framers like Madison. You know, uh, you had people like Byrd and others who regularly crossed with Democratic presidents when they usurped congressional authority. Right. That's largely gone. I mean, it. It is a sad commentary on, on Congress. Madison truly believed that self-interest would prevail. He believed that you could use ambition to fight ambition. And he assumed that, that even if you were the member of the same party as the president, you would jealously protect your own power. Well, these people have challenged that notion. You know, they're their ambitions lie out elsewhere. He didn't anticipate the Leninist impulse of some on the left. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so let's talk about 303 Creative versus Elenis. Talk to us about this case. Why was this uh, so important and how did the court decide? Well, this was my favorite case, and I've been writing about it for years. I've been actually following the case in columns before it actually was uh, the opinion was issued by the Tenth Circuit. And ironically, after the Tenth Circuit ruled, I was speaking to the Tenth Circuit at their judicial conference, and I told the judges um, how thankful I was that they got 303 so unbelievably wrong, uh, because it would finally guarantee that the Supreme Court could not avoid this issue any longer. And you could hear the gnashing of teeth in the audience, but the Tenth Circuit opinion was absolutely terrifying. They literally said in that opinion that the purpose of this law, which is called CADA, that would, would re require people to do things like same-sex marriage websites, um, that the purpose of the law is to get rid of bad ideas. That's a, almost a direct quote of the Tenth Circuit. They said this law is all about eliminating bad ideas. And so for free speech advocates, it was a bloody nightmare. I mean, you had a Tenth Circuit uh, decision that said we're all about removing ideas from the marketplace. And so what you had was a, a website designer who 
was not only being forced to speak, but was also being censored. So she put up a statement on her website that says, look, this is why I don't do websites for same-sex marriage. This is my religious beliefs, and this is why I'm going to be consistent with those beliefs. The, the commission said, not only do you have to take down that from your website, but you also have to, uh, in fact, perform these duties. And when she said, look, there's lots of people that do websites, half the teenagers in America do websites, the Tenth Circuit got around that by saying that you have a monopoly on you. This is almost, again, a direct quote. They, they said that she was monopolizing her own talents. They didn't want someone else to do the website if people wanted her to do the website. And so they portrayed her sort of like Andrew Carnegie, that she was a monopoly. Uh, denying others herself, and it, it just—it was so Orwellian. It was that's the reason I thanked the Tenth Circuit, just because it was so far beyond the pale. That I hoped that the, the the Supreme Court would take a different tack. Because about about twenty years ago, I wrote a piece saying we're heading to a collision point between anti-discrimination laws and the religion clauses and the free speech. And when I argued in that piece was that these are really not religion cases, that the Supreme Court has gotten them wrong because it keeps on going to the religion clauses. It needs to view these as a free speech case. And so when 303 went up to the Supreme Court, a great moment occurred because it went up with both a religious clause claim and a free speech claim, and the court only took the free speech claim. So it was like Cortez burning his boats at the, at the water's edge. So and what, I was delighted. So what I, I like to do in these instances is, and, and I think it is actually one of the most effective ways of taking these apart, is simply ask the question, but change the situation. So you have an individual in Colorado who only does gay, uh, you know, same-sex websites for marriages, right? And a heterosexual couple comes to him and says, hey, we'd like you to make a website for us. And he says, no, you know, I'm, you know, this is my, this is my thing. You know, I'm the queer website guy. And they say, well, no, we want you. Is it right for the state to force him? And of course, the answer from everybody would be, well, of course not. You know, how dare they try to abrogate the rights of this queer website maker who's speaking out his values. And that's the thing. That's why it made so little sense. Was it actually only applied in the circumstances that they wished it to apply to? Nonetheless, the headline on the front page of the Financial Times covering this was setback for gay rights. And I was like, what? I just, you know, I think you explained it well. And yet, even in this instance, the court comes down 6-3. I'm going to be the, you know, I'm going to be the three person. I'm going to be the one who, who keeps asking, what did the What's three, wrong with the three? What did the three say to defend this idea? No, this was particularly unnerving to see the three justices in the dissent, because obviously the same protection would apply to an LGBT web designer who was asked to do something uh, that she disagreed with. It also protects a Jewish baker from being asked to do a Mein Kampf cake or a, an African-American cake. baker from doing a KKK cake. And for all of them, I hope they would tell the person, you know, frankly, Get the heck out of my shop. I, I, I don't want to do this. You're asking me to participate in a message I find deeply offensive. So this idea that this was an anti-LGBTQ type of <laughs> decision is just outrageous. And it just shows how, again, disconnected the coverage is from the actual cases. And, you know, one of the problems with the dissent is they had no limiting principle. They didn't even try to come up with any limiting principle for the government going forward and getting rid of other bad ideas, just like the 10th Circuit said, you know, that uh, to just make society better by taking out bad ideas. And these three justices signed off on it. I'm not, you know, the funny thing is, you know, Justice Sotomayor, when she was nominated, I, um, I raised a concern about one of her cases. Now, Sotomayor did not have a very extensive 
or comprehensive cases. And I noted that on NBC and everyone said, Shirley said Sotomayor is smart enough, which is not what I, I said. I said she was actually very smart. But I said she hadn't been an intellectual leader in her opinions, that her opinions were very short, that we actually didn't have very good insights into how she viewed the law. But the one case where we did get an insight worried the heck out of me because she supported a school district in punishing a student for something that the student said in social media um, outside of school. And the opinion was really chilling in my view. And I, I admit, people call me a free speech absolutist. Um, I'm really not, but there was a time when that was a compliment. But um, it was a chilling decision. Now, this sort of is in line with that view of her more narrow view of free speech. I've been very impressed with Sotomayor in many other respects. I disagree with her rulings. I think that she has, you know, she's obviously developed her own jurisprudence. And, her, you know, there was a, the president had a right to pick someone that reflected that truth. But this opinion, I agree with you. It's frightening. Uh, and it's even more frightening to see how the media has misrepresented. But what provenance in the Constitution did the dissent in this case find in the interest of the state controlling the speech of individuals? Well, they just have this very broad view of anti-discrimination laws, that they are both constitutionally and statutorily mandated, and they believe that this is outside of protected speech because you are engaging in a discriminatory act. So they see no difference at all between telling a couple they can't sit at a lunch counter and telling a couple, I won't do your wedding cake. But of course, there is a big difference. All of these individuals, including Masterpiece Cake Shop, that came before the Supreme Court, all of them said, we serve anyone. And any things that are pre-made, like cakes and flowers, they all agreed, of course, we don't discriminate against anyone. It's only expressive and creative products that are issued here. And the, the, the dissent just simply doesn't acknowledge it. They just say it's all discrimination. Well, this is what I found so fascistic about the left is that, you know, there are there no pro LGBT florists or cake bakers. I can take uh, out you to there. a view in Adams Morgan. That Mark. It, it, it's it's this desire to go find somebody who disagrees and make an example of them and force them to speak beliefs that they don't share in order to tell the rest of us that you will you will comply with the new cultural you know demands of the, of society. Yeah. It's an authoritarian impulse, isn't it? It is. You know, tomorrow I'm, I'm actually wrapping up my manuscript in a book on free speech, and it sort of goes into the our history of free speech and this pattern of intolerance uh, that we see throughout our history, including at our founding. And this is right out of that. I mean, the, the, the people that oppose free speech today are adopting the identical language used Back in the Adams administration, during the Alien and Sedition Act prosecution, they all are just viewing certain types of speech as harmful. And, and while they didn't use the term disinformation, they had they used the terms uh, that of uh, this type of false claims as a justification for censorship. All of this is a, is is just a, a, a pulling of the page from those periods. And I had hoped that. This would be one moment where the three liberal justices would be like Gorsuch and say, you know what, people need to understand this is a free speech case, and we're only talking about expressive products here, and we're not talking about you know striking down the public accommodation laws, and I'm going to vote with the rest of the court. That didn't happen. I think that will taint their legacy. This, the problem is popular speech doesn't need protection. The First Amendment is designed to protect unpopular speech, and it wasn't that long ago that supporting gay marriage was very unpopular. You would think they'd have some historical muscle memory. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. And you know, I've supported same-sex marriage for over three decades when it, it was incredibly unpopular to do so. And it's a really, it's a, the greatest point. I see this in academia a lot. You know, I also supported bringing on to faculties 
uh, people who were crits and and feminists who were fairly extreme because I felt you know what we should have different perspectives on the faculty. But we reached a point of critical mass where those same individuals who were in the minority then virtually purged faculties of conservative libertarian, and we're seeing the same thing happen here. And it's really amazing because the people that were the subject of this type of discrimination are now the leading voices for censorship and intolerance. But, you know, it's censorship and intolerance, you know, against the people they dislike. So that's okay. You need to understand how this works. I don't understand what's so mysterious to you. All right, so we have buried the lead because probably the uh, decision that got the most attention, certainly <laughs> certainly from my daughter, who texted it to me when I was overseas with, decision is out, and then thank, and then a swear word, then an apology for the swear word, God for this period, I have a screenshot of it because, of course, she went through the admissions process. Uh, in this case, not at one of the specific schools that were mentioned, but she went through the admissions process and found it as Orwellian as so many Americans have. Talk to us about Students for Fair Admissions and the decision that was made. Well, in, in, this is another amazing thing about the coverage because uh, you had President Biden stating, and he was uncontradicted in the media, that this breaks 50 years of precedent, which it, 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 it's, it's so absurd. It is almost comical. In the 70s, the court got rid of affirmative action admissions. In the Bakke case, I was a young student standing outside uh, the court when that decision came down. Tell people a little and, bit more about that, that case. And that case involved a guy that was applying to medical school and the court, and they had a quota, and he was the wrong race. He was white. And the court said, you can't do that, okay? You, you can't do it in employment. You can't do it in admission. But what happened is that Powell on the court um, granted what he considered a narrow exception. Ironically, they called it the Harvard approach. And the Harvard approach was to use race as one of a number of criteria to preserve diversity. And the court thought that that could be a limited, very, you know, small type of accommodation to achieve greater diversity. Well, of course, the universities then went, got rid of quotas and they went to these robust diversity systems and had the same percentage where they were bringing in uh, based on race. And what these cases did is they put it in a rather different context because they were cases were brought by Asian Americans who had tremendous scores and were denied. And they were denied through a fairly cynical system by Harvard, where they included a ranking for personality. And it just turned out that all Asians were given low scores, or many of them, most of them were given low scores. To the point that Chief Justice Roberts mocked uh, the counsel for Harvard and said, do you think that Asians just aren't patriotic and are just not interesting people? Because that's what it seems like. They always come out with this low score. And counsel sort of struggled with it, but it was very clear to everyone that this was a buried race criteria system. So, But over that 50 years, it was a series of 5-4 decisions and plurality. This opinion was supposed to be issued back in 2003 in the Gruder case. Right. I was just about yeah, um, to ask you about that. Yeah. Sandra Day O'Connor O'Connor flipped sides and then said, I'm going to allow it, but in, in 25 years, this will be unacceptable. Now, many of us at the time said, where did that come from? Since when do you have <laughs> an expiration date? <laughs> right. So there's an expiration date on your rulings. I mean... And, 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 and to be honest, some of the justices did not sign on to that part of the decision. But that was 20 years ago. And so even Senator O'Connor did not feel comfortable with saying you can use race indefinitely. And so time came up. And the, the court kept on reminding counsel of that Gruder component. But in the end, this what this court is most distinct about in the last two years is they're bringing clarity to these areas in a way that many on the left don't like. And so they provide clarity with regard to Roe v. Wade and Dobbs. That was another area of divided 5-4 rulings. And they finally 
adopted a fairly bright line, sending it back to the state. This was another such case where they said, you know what? We've been wrong to try to find ways to allow discrimination. And this was the, the capstone for Chief Justice Roberts. It may be his, his, the case he's most remembered for. Because for years, the chief has said the way to end racial discrimination is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And he finally secured that opinion. And I expect this will be probably the capstone of his time on the court. So aren't admissions offices going to find a loophole through this? Because we, we uh, Danny and I have a mutual friend who is on the board of a very prestigious secondary school. And when this case was working its way through the courts, uh, they had a board meeting. And uh, the admissions people said, well, this isn't going to affect us because we do in-person in- interviews. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, you no. Know, yeah. They, I mean, if they don't think that this is a legitimate court and they don't think these are legitimate opinions, aren't, aren't we going to see a lot of schools just doing it anyway and finding a new way to do it? Well, Robert's already gave them that approach. Yeah, you can still, in an essay, talk about how you individually overcame racial discrimination. So what all the schools are going to do is they're going to prompt applicants and say, have you encountered racial or other discrimination? And so the kids will self-identify. They won't have a box. Instead, they'll have some other category that says a motive or personal triumph story, you know, and they will continue to do it. Harvard pledged that they're not going to give up. They're going to use, they're still going to do this. All of the universities I know of issued statements denouncing this opinion, I wonder what my Asian students, Asian American students felt like, because it was like all of these universities were saying, this is outrageous. And if you're an Asian American, it's like, well, I don't think it's that outrageous because I was told to hide the fact that I was Asian in order to apply. But the most interesting thing that came out after the opinion, I wrote a column about this on my blog, is that since Baki, the universities, including in this last argument before the court, have assured the court that the race criteria is one of many and is not that heavily weight. And they repeated that as they had to in front of the court. The minute the court ruled against use of race, every university came out and said, our numbers of, of African-American and Hispanic students will now plummet. And all of these commentators said, It's going to be an all-white class. And it's like, wait, wait. (laughs) For 50 years, you've said that this was not a heavily weighted factor. And now you're saying that it will decimate admissions. And so it's a a rather interesting shift. So let's just talk for a second about the root question here. So without waiting for race among black people or Hispanics, their numbers go drastically down. But nobody asks the question, why is it that these high school kids are not performing optimally? And of course, the reason they don't ask that question is because they don't want to talk about crap quality schooling that these kids are getting. You know, inner city schools that are failing again and again and again and again, that are truly the examples of racism in our society. Why is it that this is not something that the justices, who themselves have, have must have seen these things, our minority justices, who must have seen the inequities in education, why is it that, that this is a mystery to them? Well, that's what was so maddening about Gavin Newsom's statement that you know, look, our numbers of admissions plummeted when when affirmative action was stopped. Um, because, you know, the answer is exactly as you raised. You know, instead of trying to just check off a box and satisfy your diversity goal, why not do the hard work and actually improve these schools, particularly in urban areas? Public education is a scandal. I mean, they have, they have been writing off generations of, African-American kids, I, uh, you know, there was one mother in Baltimore that recently balked when her son was graduating in the top half of his class after failing all but one class in, 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 in high school. And she said, no, don't graduate my son. You know, you have 
a huge number of kids that cannot even meet proficient levels of reading and writing. And the result is that they're getting rid of all the standardized tests. They're hiding it because the, the, they don't want to do the tough work. And it is a really sad thing to watch because I've been a big advocate of public education my whole life. My parents helped start one of the organizations that sought to keep white families in public schools in Chicago. It's called the Tri-Faith Movement. And they believe strongly, as I do, that public schools play a big role in a democracy. And my kids, we've kept our kids in public schools for that reason all the way through college. And I was happy with, with the education in McLean. But the very people that are objecting to this are destroying the public education system. Parents are leaving in droves because they want their kids to learn to read and write and add and subtract. Uh, and instead, they get nothing but this type of agenda training that, that in, in schools where they should be trying desperately to deal with these basic skills. And uh, that's the saddest point of all of this, is that the people being hurt here are these students. And there's no division on that, by the way. The American people have always opposed affirmative action in education, even in California, the most liberal state in the country, they have repeatedly rejected affirmative action in education, despite multi-million dollar campaigns. They also support our public schools, but we keep on pouring billions into these schools, and it's wasted. So let's end where we began, which is the legitimacy of the court. So we're always told that the court is illegitimate because it's out of step with the American people, which I didn't know that that was the job of a justice to be in step with public opinion. But on this case, there was a poll, I believe this is a Pew poll, shows percentage of adults who say that colleges should consider race or ethnicity when deciding which students to accept in their school. No. Total, 82 percent. Black, 71 percent no. Hispanic, 81 percent no. White, 84 percent no. Asian, 76 percent no. I mean, this is if there's if there was unanimity in the country on almost anything, it's this. So how does this make the court illegitimate? No, that's that's what's so funny about what the president said. He said, you know, the people are very upset with this. And you read it like, what it's universe are you living in? I mean, it's, uh, uh, the polls show that exactly that because it's in our DNA. You know, the citizens don't like people being treated differently due to their race. And you had the president of SUNY two days ago saying, you know, these people just don't understand how admissions work. This really doesn't help this decision. It doesn't help. Uh, white and Asian students. It only hurts African-American students because we're going to have more Asian and white students admitted. And this was said on NPR and the host went, oh, okay. And you wanted to call it, say, you do realize that what he just said was utter nonsense, right? I mean, the, he was saying that it doesn't, that none of this works for against uh, white and Asian students, but they will be dramatically increased in admissions if they're considered on individual merit. And that's what the American people are saying. It's a disgrace. I mean, the whole thing is a, a, a disgrace. And, and I would say that the efforts to gin up opinions against the court by the media have just been utterly and completely infuriating. But that's the country we live in now. But it's working. I mean, the polls show that the number of people who hold the court in high esteem is, is record lows right now. Yeah, I'm afraid it is. And you have people who just simply have a crisis of faith. They don't believe in our system. You've got people like AOC who actually said she doesn't understand why we have a Supreme Court. And okay, it's a little bit late to I don't understand that. why she's a congresswoman. So <laughs> feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, you've been just terrific. Thank you so much. You're as busy as a, as a person could be these days. And so thank you for taking out a little time out of your time, too. And for all well, of our listeners to have a chance, because, you know, we we all watch you on Fox and they give you about five minutes. And just to see your brilliance in depth is a real treat for our listeners. Well, I appreciate you both having me on. Thank you so much. Thanks a ton, Jonathan. It was really a pleasure to meet you. Let's talk about the legitimacy of the Supreme Court and who's responsible for the uh, political polarization. So, you know, we just talked about the cases that broke down on ideological lines, but there were a few other cases that didn't break down on ideological lines. You have the case on federal election law and redistricting where the liberal bloc voted together with Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Barrett against Gorsuch, Alito, and Thomas. 
You had upholding uh, Biden's immigration authority where it was unanimous except for Justice Alito. You had a case on Native American adoptions where the liberal bloc and Roberts, Kavanaugh, Barrett and Gorsuch all voted together against Alito and Thomas. You had a case on online messaging and threats where Barrett and Thomas were the only two in dissent. It seems like there seems to be a lot more flexibility among the conservative justices to vote with the liberal bloc than the other way around when it comes to when it comes to a lot of these cases. Were any of the examples that you looked at, because I see you're looking at a list of the decisions, were any of those examples where the conservatives peeled off liberal members of the court? Or did I they don't... vote as a bloc to quote Sheldon Whitehouse all the time? I'm looking now at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven cases and every single one of them the liberal bloc voted together. Exactly. And there are at least four cases in which members of the conservative bloc crossed over and voted with the other side. So, so res ipsa loquitur, since, uh, as, <laughs> as, they say, as they say in Latin, Mark. the thing speaks for itself. So what, I, what is interesting to me is that what you laid out right at the beginning is that the people who are resolutely not crossing over to the liberal side, because Roberts does it often, uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh do it occasionally, are Alito and Thomas. And it is so weird to me, this f strange coincidence that ProPublica, this muckraking organization of press reporters who are so nonpartisan, has only gone after Alito and Thomas yeah. in their investigations. A little so, after Roberts, too. Uh, maybe a little. Yeah. But it was interesting to me because I was chit-chatting with a friend who's a lawyer about this, and they were saying to me, so... You know, they never asked, for example, about Justice Breyer, who constantly was riding on the billionaire Pritzker's plane and was paid annually to be a judge for the Pritzker Prize. <laughs> I don't understand. Why is that not troubling to anybody? I'm sure I could pull up a dozen other examples. Apparently, there are a huge number in in. in basically every case. And part of the reason is because, guess what? Supreme Court justices don't get paid a ton of money. They get a lot for speeches. They get a lot to go out and do stuff. And they have important and influential friends. And until now, we didn't worry our little heads about it. But now we're very concerned. Well, the reason we're concerned now is because for the first time, uh, we had a president, and we, you'll, have, you'll have, gonna have to give him grudging credit here, Danny, who has a perfect record in Supreme Court appointments. The big problem we've had as conservatives is that every president, going all the way back to Nixon, Reagan, Bush 41, Bush 43, half of the people that they pick, they're not even batting 500, half of the justices they pick either completely defect to the liberal bloc or become these swing votes that vote with the other side. Not, not just on the easy cases where there's unanimity, but on like big major cases that, that would normally draw down on ideological lines. And that's not happening now in the same way. And that's why the left is upset, because they're used to getting at least half of our justices coming over to their side. And the court can't be legitimate if they if, they, if there's ideological consistency on the right. And I got to tell you, we, we Donald Trump gets credit for that. But and you know who else gets credit for it? Mitch McConnell, because Mitch McConnell him, stood firm, stood firm, if uh, you know, and protected the Senate's prerogatives. Exactly. That's so weird. And so why you know, would he do that? And so and you know, so we we now finally have and a 6-3 conservative majority that is actually a conservative majority, that isn't an evenly split court with one swing vote who goes like a weather vane and no matter which direction the political winds are going. And so, you know what? I'm sorry. I guess if you're on the left, that makes it illegitimate. It's not. It, what it means is uh, elections have consequences. Well, you don't understand what legitimacy oh, means, I'm sorry, Mark. Dan. Legitimacy <laughs> means agrees with me. Hey, folks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for being with us. Don't hesitate to send us suggestions. And happy 4th to all who celebrated. Take care. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.